Good morning, everyone. Today I'm going to read an article that I, I wrote some years ago for the um, Pasadena Theosophical Society magazine, Sunrise. And it's called The Paths of Love. Well, the word the word love has been used in modern society until it, it, has, it has lost its spiritual potency. It has been covered with the mire of earthly fancies and illusions, being connected almost exclusively with the procreative act and to certain emotional attachments. Concepts far from the def definitions that we find in theosophical literature the world over and in many other uh, genuine uh, spiritual traditions. Those who have an inkling of its true meaning need to make the effort to restore it to its original splendour. True love is the redeeming quality hidden in the heart of each one of us, awaiting the day when it, it, it is allowed free expression once more. As we explore the impersonal nature of spiritual love, we find in its very depths the common ground that unites us all as truly human beings. Love is a wonderful, magical thing, but we somehow missed the point and retreated to systems of thought that serve no ultimate purpose except the aggrandisement of the personal self. If you listen to uh, talks, YouTube videos, etc., or attend meetings, we become aware of the importance of love in, for example, in New Age philosophies. Degrees of understanding and interpretation vary, ranging from the sexually orientated through a whole spectrum of emotions towards a vaguely mystical awareness of some greater power, usually personified. Surely these are the paths of love, though often at a level where love and sensuality can become confused. A great many New Age movements advocate practice of the sexual act to achieve a kind of spiritual awakening. And the trend of modern spiritual groups is to revel in imagery and sound, bright colours and strong perfumes, while in themselves may be harmless or may not be in some cases, brings the danger of mistaking shadows for reality. And for substance. If we become infatuated with sensual sounds and sights, with flowery words, just with flowery words that bewitch the mind and have no ultimate essential meaning, they, they will bewitch the soul and mind of the listener. We will never pierce the veil and find the silence that is our true guide in all circumstances. At the very core of our being, is the desire for solidarity with all that lives. So that sometimes our alienation seems too much to bear. Humanity cries out for harmony. And it is there if we look deep and deeply enough for it. There is this harmony within the very centre of our being, heart of our being. H.P. Blavatsky writes of that spark of divine love for light and harmony, that no hate could wholly smother. And this is the great hope that humanity carries with it. That spark of divine love for light and harmony that no hate can wholly smother. That's the beautiful words. This spark of divine love is a thousand times more rich in potentiality than the hate that seems to be predominant in the world today. If we have a clear picture of where we came from and whither we are returning, we can then see evil in its true light as a temporary manifestation fabricated from the human mind. As an old saying in the East says, it's, I think it's Miyamoto Musashi, he said, there is no evil in the void. There's no evil in the void, nor is there any good. There's no, definitely no evil in the void. Society judges by appearances and finds it difficult to see the soul of things. Humanity regards the great truths of nature as scans and is afraid of the unknown. 
even if that unknown contains secrets that are beautiful beyond words. We do not look inwards. We float on the surface instead of diving deep within. In our day-to-day -day lives, we can have no conception of the wonders that lie waiting behind the veils of time. We are afraid to take chances and make that leap over the chasm that seems to separate the material life from the spiritual one. It takes courage to realise that this gulf is an illusion and that there is no difference except in degree of understanding. We make our own barriers and we can break them down. The spark of divine love will one day become a flame and each one of us has the power to speed that process on. Individually and collectively, we can become channels for the love that lies at the heart of all things. Such real channeling demands a life of, of purity and discipline. But not discipline performed with heavy hearts or reluctantly, and not a, a purity forced upon one by religion or by guilt or whatever. It must not be done with heavy heart or reluctantly either. Only joy can carry us through the terrible trials we face in our journey. In some spiritual literature, there's been a misleading emphasis on struggle rather than on the bliss that one feels as the tyr tyrannical lower self gradually dissolves and gives way to the pure spiritual light of truth. We need to find that spark of divine love and a faith in the divine, not blind faith, but a firm reliance on the eff eff you know, efficiency of the spiritual self as a result of enlightened study and meditation. This kind of faith brings us to the quintessential experience of love. At a certain point in our evolution, we, we realise that love is by far the most important thing for us to cultivate. We see clearly the shallowness of mere conceptual teaching, while at the same time, the sufferings of humanity may burn into our very souls. The world groans under the weight of its misery, and our immediate task is to ease that pain. We look forward to the day when human and purely individual personal feelings, blood ties and friendships, patriotism and race predilection, all give way to become blended into one universal feeling, the only true and holy, the only unselfish and eternal one love and immense love for humanity as a whole. That's from the Mahatma Letters to A.P. Sin at page 32. Um, but of course, until then, we need to develop love within ourselves for um, love for ourselves, love for others, love for our family, love for our friends, because that's the, the only way we can reach universal love, by developing the highest and purest love we can have for our family, our friends, our uh, uh, you know, for whoever, but realizing that we're on our way to this universal love and not become too selfishly attached to to um to individual love, realizing that it is a gateway. In the East, people learn to love um, like Krishna, like gods like Krishna, etc. Because uh, but they, but when they reach a certain stage, they will dissolve that image and go beyond and find um, the true love that's, that's impersonal. But it is not by blindly following words in a book that we can become the benefactors of humanity. And to work for them without love often ends in disappointment. Virtue needs to be developed for the right motives. We must constantly look into our motives and periodically review our, our ideals so that they remain in tune with the harmony we feel at the centre of our being. There is this harmony there at the centre of our being. We can, we can find it, we look for it. In this light, we can see that morality, enforced from without, has no value. In the Elixir of Life, from five years of Theosophy, page 17, it said, not only is all goodness that results from the compulsion of physical force, threats or bribes, whether of a physical or so-called spiritual nature, absolutely useless to the person who exhibits it. 
It's hypocrisy tending to poison the moral atmosphere of the world. But the desire to be good or pure, to be efficacious, must be spontaneous. It must be a self-impulse from within, a real preference for something higher, not an abstention from vice because of fear of the law, not a chastity enforced by the dread of public opinion, not a benevolence exercised through love of praise or dread of consequences in a hypothetical future life. <clears throat> in trying to escape these constraints, many unfortunately lack the preference for something higher and leap straight into the fire of passion that eats away at the very fabric of civilization and prevents mankind from experiencing states of being higher and infinitely more satisfying. In the final analysis, even love itself has to give way to something higher. But the path of love leads to these dizzy heights, because love is the harmony that lies at the heart of all things. It is intimately connected with compassion and is an essential practice for all those who admire the teachings of the great masters like Jesus, uh, Gautama Buddha and countless others who have emphasised the importance of loving kindness in daily thought and practice. It is the only effective way to break down divisions and realise oneness. The love of collective humanity should become our increasing inspiration and guideline to constant practice. Universal brotherhood of humanity, regardless of race, creed, sex, caste or colour, represents the actualization of this practice. Brotherhood based upon cold uh, political reasoning can never last. As H.P. Blavatsky says in The Voice of the Silence, compassion is no attribute. It is the law of laws, eternal harmony, a liar's self, a sureless universal essence, the light of everlasting right, the unfitness of all things, the law of love eternal. The more thou dost become at one with it, thy being melted into its being, the more thy soul unites with that which is, the more thou wilt become compassion absolute. So compassion is a very, is a very, very important thing in, in today's society. And we must never underestimate the power of compassion and of love. And if we realise it, we realise that, we can make great progress in helping to ease the pain of humanity and of this planet that we're on. We can see nowadays that terrible things are going on because people do not realise what we are in reality, what we are as truly human beings. You know, Confucius said that if we do not develop fellow feeling, we are no more than mannequins. And the Taoists say that if you reach a certain stage on the progress of enlightenment, you become real human beings. Because until then, we, you know, we're just living animalistic lives, in a sense. It's only by developing love, peace, harmony, compassion within ourselves and spreading that out into the world that we can become truly human and we can help this world to become better. But one thing that you must never do is give up hope because hope is something we must always have and hope is very much important. People might say, oh, the world's too bad, we can't do nothing about it, it's... It's gone too far, it's, you know, it's terrible. We're going to have a dystopian future, everything's going to be, too, you know. That's just spreading negativity. We must always believe that we can create a golden age on Earth. It may, we may not see it in our time, we may not see it for centuries, but if we plant the seeds, the seeds will grow into the flower of purity, of compassion, love, all the things that we need on this planet at the moment. And always we can sow little seeds, we can all do little things. And never, as I said, never think that, that, that what we're doing is too little. What we're doing is never, ever too little. H.P. Blavatsky says in the Key to Theosophy that even giving a cup of water to someone in need is much better than buying countless meals for someone who can afford them. Just a little, little tiny act. You know, just a, a kind word sometimes can lift a person. A little bit of kindness. Again, in theosophy, it's said that, you know, most people will respond to words of kindness and of love. 
not everybody, but 99.9% will will respond to words of kindness and of love and of compassion. Always do what's good. Because if you just give people anger, hatred, you're just increasing the, the anger and the hatred in them, and not just them, but you're incre in, increasing anger and hatred in the entire world. The storehouse of anger and hatred. Add to the storehouse of love and compassion, peace, love, harmony, all the beautiful things. Because this world's beautiful. Look at it. Look at nature. Look at sunrises, sunsets. Look at what people create sometimes. Beautiful art, music, poetry. It, 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 it's wonderful. People create beautiful things. And where do they come from? It comes from the soul. It comes from the heart. It comes from the very essence of their being. A desire to create something beautiful. I think um, Edward Byrne Jones says something like, I'll always paint angels or something, angels, because you have to counteract the, the darkness and the evil in the world. They always create beautiful things, beautiful art, beautiful poetry, beautiful music. And what's very important is the motive. It's you, have, it's you have the motive to create something wonderful and beautiful. And that's the most important thing of all. Uh, and not everybody's artistic. People can just do things. They can just help in, in, in their day-to-day -day life and do what they can, say kind words, think kind thoughts, do, do, do kind acts, spontaneous acts of kindness, acts of love, acts of... Just bring a little bit of hope to the world, a bit of light to the world, a bit of compassion to the world. Uh, and we are on the spiritual path. People who are listening to this watching this must be on the spiritual path. We're the ones who can do it. Always have hope. Always think that what we're doing is for, is for the good and will have positive benefits in years to come, even if we don't see it. Even if we don't see it, we're planting seeds. There's always a, a reason to be optimistic, to think, to be, to be optimistic in all of our daily day life. Never despair, never give up, never despair of humanity. So thank you anyway for listening and have a good day, a good week, a good year, a good life. And Om Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. Peace, peace, peace. Peace on earth and goodwill to all beings. See you all very, very soon.